are many patients here who have IBD and they feel that they're at, at higher risk. Uh, and I'm just wondering, you know, there's a spectrum of IBD from you know, a patient with ulcerative colitis just on, on a 5-ASA drug to you know, an older individual who might be on a biologic. And I just wanted to get a sense from you, what are the types of extra precautions we should be thinking about in, in patients who have IBD? It's a great question. So to your point, yeah, there's a range of immunosuppression that we see in folks. And certainly it, it would appear that people who are the most immunosuppressed on the most immunosuppression are probably somewhat more at risk. Age is the biggest one, but also immunosuppression that's very significant. For people who are in the lowest risk category, there's not a ton we'd suggest that we would do deliberately very differently. Um, again, Really, in terms of testing, should we? Someone asked me today. Someone who has uh, who is on a biologic uh, has IBD, they're pretty well controlled in that particular case. Um, who's on an anti-TNF agent, and they came and they said, "Well, you know, I've got a I've got a runny nose. I think I should be tested before anyone else." Isn't that the case? Um, and actually, that doesn't actually help us. Uh, right now, the test, if you don't have fever or a cough, the test, when you're relatively asymptomatic or don't have the case definition symptoms, isn't that useful. And what I mean by that is you could get a negative test, but it wouldn't be helpful because it could be a false negative. So waiting until the appropriate timing for getting tested is very important. Uh, do I recommend that people wear masks? if they're on immunosuppression and just out doing their regular work. Masks on you when you don't have any symptoms are not helpful. So walking around with a mask on does not actually protect you any more than if you don't have a mask and doing all the stuff you're supposed to be doing. I can imagine wearing a, a mask, you're probably putting your hands on your face, you're probably putting yourself in potentially at, at higher risk. And, um, and Dr. Targonowick, I know that uh, uh, Lisa just gave a really nice uh, description of social distancing. And I wonder if you could talk a little bit about kind of the different risk groups that we have in, in IBD um, and any, any extra precautions that you, that you think they should consider. So I, I just want to start off with, with a couple of uh, maybe, you know, I know we hear a lot of negative news. So I want to talk about something that may be a little bit reassuring, which is, uh, you know that probably most patients with inflammatory bowel disease, we do not believe that they are at increased risk of getting serious infection over everyone else. So as Dr. Baird alluded to, most of the advice that we're giving to patients with inflammatory bowel disease is the same kind of advice that we would give everybody. Now, um, when we think about like, what are the risk factors for getting, uh, uh, for getting more ill, for getting more serious complications, like ending up being hospitalized or God forbid, ending up in the intensive care unit, a lot of the same risk factors are the same ones that would apply across the population, which is people who are older. If you happen to have not just inflammatory bowel disease, but other comorbid conditions, particularly heart disease and respiratory disease. Um, and then if you are an immuno, um, and then as uh, Dr. Barrett also alluded to, um, if you are immunosuppressed. And so the question is, if you fall into one of these categories, should you be doing anything? Um, should you be going, doing anything different? So I think one thing is be extra diligent about following the advice of staying away from uh, from large crowds. Uh, you know, make it more avoidable than it might be for other people. Um, like you said, washing your hands frequently. And so you know, the question that I know has come up in a lot of my patients who've uh, come to me with inflammatory bowel disease is you know surrounds should I be going to work? Now I know many workplaces have tried to move to a place where you're starting to work more um, from home when you can. And this is fine for some jobs. If you work at a desk um, and you're working at a computer, many of those jobs can be easily done at home, or there can be technologies that we have in place, very much like the one we're using today, that facilitate working from home. And yet I still know there are other people who either have to go into work because they're in a, a type of job where you physically need to be at that place, um, 
you know, the other concern people have is how am I going to get to work? I know many of us drive, but many of us are also reliant on public transportation. That may put us into contact with more surfaces that may be contaminated. It may put us more into contact with other people. And I, um, for my patients with inflammatory bowel disease, particularly if they fit into any of those categories, being older, having respiratory or cardiac illnesses, or being on immunosuppression, um, I think um, this is a good time to uh, you know, if you can, to be excused from work, if you can, ha if, if you can handle it, um, or to be allowed to work from home. Um, now, as we learn more, these recommendations may change, but I think this is reasonable for patients who are more immunosuppressed. Now, this comes to the next question, I guess, which is who is really immunosuppressed? Because as you know, there are a lot of people who are on many different medications for inflammatory bowel disease, and they probably do not carry with it all the same risk of immunosuppression. So many of you who have mild disease may be on the class of medications we call 5-ASAs. So these are drugs like Pentassa, Risalafolk, or Asacol, or Mesavant. Uh, so many of you who have mild disease, particularly ulcerative colitis, are on these medications. We do not believe that these increase the level of immunosuppression. In addition, if you happen to be using suppositories or rectal therapies, we do not believe those increase the risk of immunosuppression. Now, um, when it comes to the biologic agents, so these are the ones that are generally given by injection or where you go to an infusion center, we know in general in inflammatory bowel disease, many of these medications do appear to increase the risk of infection in general. We don't know whether these increase the risk of COVID specifically, but we are giving the advice that patients on these medications may be at increased risk. What we hope to learn over the next few weeks, as more and more patients have uh, get exposed to COVID, unfortunately, is that we will get more data as far as whether this is actually true. We may learn in time that people on these medications may not be at increased risk of complications. This would be very welcome information to learn, but this is not something we can say right now. Yes, thank, you, thank you, Laura. Um, you know, I was kind of summarizing some of the conversations we're having here and, and it, to talk to you about what, what I mean talking to my patients this past week is I kind of think about this as a, as a risk matrix where on one side of it is the feasibility to be a stationary dot to be able to stay at, at home um, if it's, you know, you're retired and, you, you know, your cruise has got cancelled. Um, it's, it's easier for you to be at home than if you're you know, a, a single parent and, and you're reliant on, on your job. Similarly, the risk of your of you as a patient with um, is different too. You might have a very low risk. You're on ulcerative colitis and on a 5AC like you described, and um, your your risk um, is much lower even if you get infected. Whereas if you um, are an older individual on a biologic risk is higher. So you've got this matrix and you kind of have to find where you are in that matrix. And part of that is your own personal decision, trying to understand what, is driving these factors for you in terms of, of mainly of economics and feasibility and whether your work allows things. Um, and then on the flip side of that is having a conversation with your doctor to get a really good understanding of what your underlying risk is, and including um, many of us are providing notes to help people make decisions around work. Um, and so if you do reach out to your gastroenterologist, these are things you can talk to them about, um, and they can help you with that risk matrix.